So one of our big issues uh, this week has been building trust between communities and uh, law enforcement. And to talk about just that, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Assistant Attorney General uh, Carol Mason, Director Ronald L. Davis, and Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Benita Gupta, all of course from the US Department of Justice. Well, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time to come talk to us today. Appreciate Thank you very much. Now, the whole conference has been talking about building trust between the communities and uh, law enforcement. How, how important of an issue is that to you right now? Well, let me start. I, I think it's incredibly important. What we learned over the years is that we cannot be effective in public safety. We cannot be effective in national security if we don't have the trust in the community that we're, that we're working with. And for us, public safety, that we're co-producers of public safety, the community and the police working together. So without trust, it makes our job almost impossible. So give me a flavor, if you will, of some of the programs that you guys are working on to, to help with that process. So one of the things that I'm happy to talk about, because it involves all of us here at, at DOJ, is our initiative of building community trust and justice. We launched it uh, two years ago and we've got six demonstration sites, but the goal of it is to use all the things we already know that work procedural justice, implicit bias, and racial reconciliation, and bring all these concepts together to figure out how to recreate safer communities um, and build that trust relationship. And Pittsburgh is one of those, and the chief of police in Pittsburgh has really embraced this program, and it's just been wonderful to see how people understand how trust is critical to having safe communities. Uh, in the Civil Rights Division, we go into jurisdictions where there has been a breakdown of significant of the breakdown of trust, and uh, where the, the inability to advance constitutional policing is really hurting officer safety and public safety, as Ronald said, because those things are so intertwined. And so we've gone into about 22 jurisdictions over the last eight years to uh, examine whether there are patterns and practices of unconstitutional policing, and then work with the police department where we make findings. Uh, over the long haul to ensure that the police department has constitutional policing practices that ultimately regain the faith and trust of the communities that they serve so that officers are better protected, so that the community is better protected, and so that the field of policing and uh, community trust is really advanced. That must be very difficult in those situations where that's happened to rebuild that trust. It is difficult, but honestly, in local communities, it's all about community will and, and working together and having stakeholder investment in the process. It takes a lot of time. It doesn't happen overnight. But I will say in recent examples that the leadership in law enforcement uh, has really proven to have a, we've had a very collaborative and cooperative relationship doing this work, in part because it really benefits everyone in local communities to engage in the hard work of rebuilding that trust. Maybe we could uh, look at that point. So, so how important is the relationship between the IACP and the DOJ? Well, I think it's critically important. Besides representing 100 countries and 17,000 plus agencies in the United States, uh, these are major stakeholders that, that we have to partner with. So for example, uh, in 2014, the president put together a task force that provided a series of recommendations on how to build trust and how to advance uh, public safety. And so the Department of Justice, COPS Office is partnered with the IACP, where we're working with 15 cities as a cohort to, that are actually implementing the recommendations so that we can develop lessons learned, best practices, and how to implement those recommendations and then put those out in the field through the IACP's newly formed Institute of Community Police Relations, which we also uh, are as co-sponsors on. And so that relationship has given us the ability to reach 800,000 police officers and deputies around the country, as well as the 17,000 plus police departments. So one of the things that we just announced with IACP is um, one of the things we've noticed, we've got all these really crises happening in communities, and how do you help communities heal from these big events? And the IACP, in partnership with the NAACP and the Yale Medical School, um, is, it, were the winners of this solicitation, and they are designing a program to go into these communities that, that have had these traumatic events and figure out how to help the entire community heal, which involves building those relationships. And the nice thing is they're also, as part of this, going to build what we call um, intervention teams that can go out when something's about to happen and figure out how to go out and intercede and keep these crises from escalating in the future. I would just say that I think that IACP has been so committed to having some really tough conversations right now and that the Justice Department has had a close partnership with IACP both through its members but also at conferences like this where they are convening folks to have these tough conversations and I think it's been a really important part of the process of healing nationally. 
Well, thank you all very much indeed for coming to talk to us. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.